Our next topic is to look at another, uh, some other types or another type of leaving group. Um, what leaving groups have we learned to use so far for SN2? Well, we basically learned only one type, right? We've learned that we can use neutral chlorine, bromine, or iodide as leaving groups. We've learned that we can use neutral bromine, chlorine, or iodide as leaving groups. Uh, but there are other acceptable leaving groups for SN2. That's what we have to learn about next. The only good leaving groups we've learned about so far are neutral chlorine, bromine, and iodide. Let's see if we can add another type of leaving group to this list. To begin with, it will be helpful to, to define the term alkyl group. Do you know what the definition of an alkyl group is? Well, we can define an alkyl group as a carbon chain attached to something else. Um, later in the course, you might need a more precise, more precise definition of an alkyl group, but for now, it'll be just convenient to say that an alkyl group is a carbon chain attached to something else. This is a term that's oftentimes used in textbooks and lectures, so you should know that when a professor refers to an alkyl group, um, for now, we can just think of that as a carbon chain attached to something else. For example, do you know what the general name for the functional group in this molecule is? Uh, well, this molecule can be called an alkyl halide. See why that's a logical name? It's called um, halide because it contains a halogen. And it it's called alkyl because it has a carbon chain attached to the halogen. So this is what I mean when I say an alkyl group is a carbon chain attached to something else. Here's an alkyl group. It's a carbon chain attached to something else. In this case, it's attached to a halogen. So what would be the general name for the functional group in this molecule? Well, that's another alkyl halide. Now let's consider this general structure. What do we call a molecule with this general structure? This general structure is referred to as an alkyl sulfonate. Alkyl sulfonate. This part is the sulfonate group. And this part is the alkyl group. In this structure, both of the R's stand for carbon chains. In this structure, both of the R's stand for two different carbon chains. Um, and this particular carbon chain is called, um, uh, is uh, where the alkyl in the term comes from. Uh, so here we have a carbon chain attached to something else. In this case, the something else is a sulfonate group. Notice that we're not using the term alkyl for this carbon chain because this carbon chain is considered part of the sulfonate group. We're using the term alkyl for this carbon chain because this carbon chain is considered to be attached to the sulfonate group, but not part of the sulfonate group. That's where we get the term alkyl sulfonate. Why are we interested in alkyl sulfonates? Because sulfonate groups are good leaving groups. We're interested in alkyl sulfonates because the sulfonate group in the alkyl sulfonate is a good leaving group. Now, it will be important for us to be able to identify the alpha carbon in a sulfonate. Where is the alpha carbon? Is the alpha carbon connected to the oxygen or to the sulfur? You need to memorize that in an alkyl sulfonate, the alpha carbon is the carbon attached to the oxygen, not the carbon attached to the sulfur. So the alpha carbon would be in this group. The alpha carbon would not be in this group. That should make sense um, because um, when the sulfonate leaves, the sulfonate is going to leave this alkyl group behind. Um, so the alpha carbon is in this group. Let's try this exercise. Take a look at this molecule. Give the general name for the functional group in this molecule. Well, I hope you recognize that this molecule matches this pattern. So the general name here is alkyl sulfonate. Also, I'd like you to label the alpha carbon. So which is the alpha carbon? Is this the alpha carbon or is this the alpha carbon? Well, we've memorized that in an alkyl sulfonate, the alpha carbon is the carbon attached to the oxygen, not the carbon attached to the sulfur. So this is the alpha carbon, the carbon attached to the oxygen. This is not the alpha carbon because it's attached to the sulfur. This carbon is considered part of the sulfonate group. 
and this is the carbon that is considered to be attached to the sulfonate group. Please try this same exercise for this molecule. Well, again, we should recognize that this is another alkyl sulfonate because, again, this group matches this pattern. And again, we should recognize that the alpha carbon is the carbon attached to the oxygen, not the carbon attached to the sulfur. Try the same exercise here. Well, again, you should recognize that this group matches this pattern. So this is a third alkyl sulfonate. And again, the alpha carbon is the carbon that's attached to the oxygen. This is not the alpha carbon, because this carbon is attached to the sulfur. Why are we interested in these alkyl sulfonates? Because all of these alkyl sulfonates have good leaving groups, which means that all these alkyl sulfonates could do... Um, so, as a result, all of these alkyl sulfonates can um, participate in SN2 reactions. That's why we're interested in these right now. By the way, you should know that this molecule is also an alkyl sulfonate. In fact, this molecule is just a different, uh, is just an abbreviation for this molecule. These two are the same molecule. This is an abbreviation that some professors like to use for this alkyl sulfonate. Um, I believe uh, that this comes from the fact that uh, this group is called toluene. This group, this group is called toluene. So um, we could call this molecule toluene sulfonate. I think that's where this abbreviation comes from. Uh, so in any case, you should know that if you see this molecule, it's another alkyl sulfonate. And where's the alpha carbon? The alpha carbon is this carbon attached to the oxygen. So notice that in this abbreviation, we show one of the oxygens in the sulfonate. We show the oxygen that's attached to the alpha carbon. If you see this molecule, you should say this is an alkyl sulfonate, and this is a good leaving group, and this is the alpha carbon. Keep in mind that a sulfonate group has three oxygens. One, two, three oxygens. One, two, three oxygens. One, two, three oxygens. Sulfonates have three oxygens. Here you can't see two of the oxygens because they're inside the TS, so to speak. But this also has three oxygens. One, two, three oxygens. Um, so if you see a, a group with two or four oxygens, that's not a sulfonate. For example, this molecule is not a sulfonate because it has four oxygens, not um, three oxygens. So here's a list of the various clues that we've seen so far for the roles that atoms can play in reactions. Previously, we saw um, that we could use neutral chlorine, bromine, and iodide as leaving groups, and now we should add sulfonates to that list. Just like a neutral chlorine, bromine, or iodide is an acceptable leaving group, a neutral sulfonate group is an acceptable leaving group. Um, when we say they're neutral, we mean they're neutral before they leave. These groups that are neutral before they leave are acceptable leaving groups. We know that they'll be negative after they leave. So we've added neutral sulfonate groups to our list of acceptable leaving groups. And we've seen that neutral chlorine, bromine, and iodide are good leaving groups. Neutral sulfonates are good leaving groups. You should know that other neutral atoms are usually not acceptable leaving groups. These are unusual. Uh, these are unusual because they're neutral and they're good leaving groups. Other neutral atoms are usually not acceptable leaving groups. You should memorize this list of acceptable leaving groups, and you should know that other neutral atoms are usually not acceptable leaving groups. So let's look again at this table that we've used so many times so far. Have you ever um, paid attention to uh, the title of the table here? Notice that this is a table that we apply to alkyl halide and alkyl sulfonate electrophiles. I haven't talked about that before, but um, so you can see in our previous videos, we've been applying this to alkyl halide electrophiles, alkyl halides. And now we can see that the same table applies to alkyl sulfonates. So this is a table we can use for alkyl halides or for alkyl sulfonates. We've already seen many examples in the past of applying this table to alkyl halides. And now let's look at a, a few examples of applying the table to reactions that involve alkyl sulfonates. Remember, an alkyl group is a carbon chain attached to something else. So an alkyl halide is a carbon chain attached to a halogen, and an alkyl sulfonate is a carbon chain attached to a sulfonate group. Please pause the video and try this problem. 
We'll start by numbering the carbons. We're unlikely to make any mistakes with this carbon, um, so I won't number that one. And uh, this is the solvent, which won't participate, so I'm not going to number that carbon um, either. So uh, let's see. Now we want to look for ionic bonds. We have sodium bromide, so we can put in the charges for that ionic bond. Now we want to uh, figure out the roles that elements are going to play. Now we do know that um, this alcohol, this is an alcohol which can be, um, uh, this is the solvent, but is, can it, also, it can also be a nucleophile. So should we use the alcohol as the nucleophile or should we use the Br minus? Well, I, I think it should be clear that the Br with the negative charge is the better nucleophile. Remember, we would only use alcohol as a nucleophile if there was nothing else better present. So we will not use the solvent as the nucleophile on this problem. Alcohol is a poor nucleophile. Br- is a good nucleophile, so we prefer to use the Br- as the nucleophile rather than the alcohol solvent. Um, now, uh, who are we going to be treating as our alpha carbon? Remember that we have memorized the alpha carbon um, for an alkyl sulfonate is the carbon that is attached to um, the oxygen, not the carbon attached to the sulfur. This is not the alpha carbon because it's attached to the sulfur. Now, this um, carbon does have a delta positive charge because oxygen is to the right of carbon in the periodic table. Oxygen wants electrons more than carbon does, so the oxygen will pull the electrons in this covalent bond closer to the oxygen and away from the carbon, which leaves a delta positive on carbon-1, which makes carbon-1 a good candidate for our electrophile. And we have memorized that the oxygen in an alkyl sulfonate is a good leaving group. Rather than saying that the entire group here is a good leaving group, at this point it's more convenient to say that this particular atom is um, a good leaving group, because this is the actual atom that will be leaving the alpha carbon. Now we can identify the mechanism. This alpha carbon is secondary. So we will be using the middle row of our table, secondary alpha carbon. You should write that down. And we decided the nucleophile is the Br minus, which puts us in the middle column. So we predict an SN2. Write that down. Now we can draw the mechanism. The electrons move away from the nucleophile towards the electrophile. And remember, this oxygen is the leaving group. So we need another arrow to show the leaving group leaving the alpha carbon. What happens in an SN2 reaction? The nucleophile attacks the alpha carbon and the leaving group leaves the alpha carbon. Now we draw the product. The nucleophile has to attack from the side opposite the leaving group. This leaving group is in front of the page, so the bromide will come in from behind the page and end up on a dash. Now, of course, we're only inverting the configuration at the alpha carbon. There's no reaction taking place at carbons 5 or 3, so there's no reason to invert the configuration at carbons 5 or 3. Uh, now we're also going to break the bond between carbon 1 and that oxygen, so that will be our other product. Uh, and um, remember, we have to change two charges. I've already changed the charge on the bromine from neutral, uh, from negative, from negative to neutral. This oxygen is at the end of the series of arrows. This oxygen started neutral, and it's gaining electrons. So the oxygen ends up with a negative charge. Make sure you draw this correctly with the negative charge. Now, in this problem, they asked us to draw the product. Well, this is probably the product that the professor cares about here, so this is what we could put in the answer box as our answer for the product, but it's important for you to understand that this is also a product. Okay, so this problem gave us some practice um, with uh, a uh, reaction on an alkyl sulfonate. Notice that this table works not just for alkyl halides, as we've used it in the past, but also for alkyl sulfonates. This molecule is an alkyl sulfonate, a carbon chain connected to the sulfonate group. We should have memorized that the sulfonate is a good leaving group. We should have memorized that the alpha carbon um, in the alkyl sulfonate is attached to the oxygen, 
not attached to the sulfur. Otherwise, we were able to use the same techniques um, to do an SN2 reaction for this alkyl sulfonate that we've used in the past for alkyl halides. We also got some practice here with how to handle a alcohol um, solvent. Alcohol was the solvent here. Um, it is possible to use alcohol as a nucleophile. Sometimes we will use the alcohol solvent as a nucleophile, um, but alcohol is a poor nucleophile, so we would only use alcohol as the nucleophile if there was nobody better present. Well, in this case, there was something better, the Br-, minus. so we did not use the alcohol as the nucleophile. In this case, we used the Br-. minus. Pause the video and try this problem. Now we'll discuss. Um, I'll start by numbering the carbons. We're not likely to make a mistake with this carbon, so I won't number that one. And this is going to turn out to be an unreactive solvent, so there's no need to number the two carbons in this molecule. Uh, we look for the ionic bond, and when we see this ionic bond, we assign charges, a positive charge on the Na, and we'll just say that there's a negative charge on this N3 group. We'll see there's a negative charge on the N3 group. When you have an N3 uh, group, it's not necessary to uh, identify exactly which nitrogen has the negative charge. We'll just treat this as a group and say the negative charge is on the group. Now we'll assign um, our roles. We know that this is going to be um, the uh, solvent. Did you recognize this as the solvent? Um, do you recognize this? This is DMSO. This is the structure of DMSO. Recall that this is the structure of DMSO, and remember that DMSO is a solvent that is not going to participate in these types of reactions. So we don't expect this solvent to participate in the reaction. By the way, this abbreviation stands for dimethyl sulfoxide. Dimethyl, because there are two methyl groups, sulf for the sulfur, O for the oxygen. And uh, the DM in DMF also stands for dimethyl because there's two methyl groups on the nitrogen. DMSO stands for dimethyl sulf oxide. We don't expect this solvent to participate in the reaction. Instead, we'll predict that the negative N3 group will be the nucleophile. Um, and we recognize this as an alkyl sulfonate. We recognize this as an alkyl sulfonate. We know the alpha carbon in the alkyl sulfonate is attached to the oxygen. This is not the alpha carbon because it's attached to the sulfur. And because the oxygen um, is more electronegative than carbon-1, carbon-1 will have a delta positive charge, which makes it electrophilic. And we know that this oxygen in an alkyl uh, sulfonate is a good leaving group. Now we can, uh, well, now we have to figure out what mechanism we're going to use. Carbon 1 is a secondary alpha carbon attached to two carbon chains. One carbon chain that starts with carbon 5 and a second carbon chain that starts with carbon 2. That puts us in the middle row. Uh, N3 minus is here in the middle column, good nucleophile weak base, so we predict an SN2 reaction. Write that down. Remember again that this table works not just for alkyl halides, but also for alkyl sulfonates. We're applying it here to an alkyl sulfonate. Now we can draw the mechanism for the SN2 using the N3- minus as the nucleophile. Here's the arrow to show the leaving group leaving. We can draw the product. This arrow tells us to form a new bond between the N3 and carbon-1. This is an unusual group where we don't, we don't try to figure out exactly which nitrogen is attached to carbon-1. We'll just treat it as a single group. We'll see the N3 group is attached to carbon-1. Um, and uh, let's see, this arrow tells us to break the bond to the oxygen in the sulfonate. Of course, we're not breaking any other bonds inside the sulfonate. We're not breaking any of these other bonds inside the sulfonate because these are covalent bonds and there's no arrows telling us to break those bonds. Uh, now we change two charges. We've already changed the N3 charge from negative to neutral. 
because it lost electrons, and the oxygen changes from neutral to negative because it gained electrons. The product, the professor probably expects this as our answer. I believe this is the first problem in this video series where we've worked with the N3 minus nucleophile. So here's a demonstration of how to work with the N3 minus nucleophile. Um, most of the time in organic chemistry, we want to focus on individual atoms, and the N3 minus nucleophile is an exception to that. We don't worry about um, the uh, individual atoms in this group, we just treat it as a single group. We don't worry about which of the nitrogens has the negative charge, we just say there's a negative charge on the N3 group as a whole. We don't worry about which of the nitrogens will act as a nucleophile, we just say that the N3 minus group will act like a nucleophile. We don't worry about which of the nitrogens will become attached to carbon 1, to the alpha carbon here, we just say that um, the N3 group will become attached to carbon 1. Notice that uh, we saw the N3 minus um, nucleophile is in the middle column of our uh, table. N3 minus is a good nucleophile and weak base, and we used that to determine that the mechanism for this reaction is SN2. Here's N3 minus in the middle column of our table. Some professors like to use um, uh, the uh, N3 minus nucleophile on exams. Other professors don't, so you may or may not um, have a professor um, that will include uh, N3 minus nucleophile on exams. This problem also gave us a little bit more practice with alkyl sulfonates. Notice that there are more than one way to draw an alkyl sulfonate. This alkyl sulfonate looks a little bit different than the previous one. Here was our previous alkyl sulfonate uh, with a CH3 group attached to the sulfur. Here's another alkyl sulfonate with a CF3 group attached to the sulfur. We saw earlier um, that there can really be any type of carbon chain. There can be any type of carbon chain in this position attached to the sulfur as long as we have these three oxygens. Um, we got some more practice, uh, we got some practice with the DMSO solvent. You should know that this is the structure for the DMSO solvent, which is a uh, unreactive solvent that's not going to be participating in these reactions. So far in this video, we've learned how to handle SN2 reactions that involve sulfonates, sulfonate leaving groups. So what else is there for us to learn about uh, sulfonates at um, this point? Well, again, what we've seen is neutral chlorine, bromine, and iodide are good leaving groups. Neutral sulfonates are good leaving groups. And we've also learned that other neutral atoms are usually not acceptable leaving groups. So that raises the question, why are sulfonates good leaving groups? So that's what I want to explain in the rest of this video. In the rest of this video, we will explain why sulfonates are good leaving groups, even though other neutral atoms usually are not good leaving groups. You might also wonder why neutral chlorine, bromine, and iodide are good leaving groups. That's a good question, but I'm not going to deal with that in uh, this video. Perhaps I'll address that in a later video. But in the rest of this video, we will discuss why neutral sulfonates are good leaving groups, even though other neutral atoms are usually not acceptable leaving groups. Why should you bother to learn the reason that sulfonates are good leaving groups? Well, for one thing, it's possible that your professor could um, test this reason directly on an exam. Um, and furthermore, um, the logic, the logic that explains why a sulfonate is a good leaving group is useful logic that you might very well um, uh, have to use at other points in your OCHEM class. Well, recall, what is the most important factor in organic chemistry? Formal charges. Does nature prefer charges to be big or small? Nature prefers small charges because that's closer to neutral, which would be best of all. Now here's a new question. Do you think nature prefers charges to be concentrated or spread out? Concentrated in a small region or spread out over a large region? What do you think? The answer is spread out. 
um, because when you uh, concentrate um, a given amount of charge in a small region, you get a large charge in that small region. But if you spread out that same charge over a larger region, um, that means that the, um, you'll have a smaller amount of charge in each place, so to speak. Spreading out a charge allows us to keep the charge smaller at each particular point, so to speak. Spread out charges um, don't build up to be as large in any particular point. So nature prefers charges to be spread out over a larger region rather than concentrate. We'll see why that's important. Let's compare these two molecules. Do you know what type of functional group we have here? I hope you know that the functional group here is an alcohol. We've learned that this is called an alcohol, an OH group connected to a carbon chain. Um, and uh, this functional group, this is a type of sulfonate. This is a type of sulfonate. So um, does either of these molecules have a good leaving group? Well, first of all, we look for formal charges. Are there any formal charges in either of these two molecules? I hope you can see there's no formal charges in either of these. Um, all the atoms in both of these molecules are non-metals. So all the bonds are covalent bonds. So we can assume there's no formal charges since no formal charges were drawn for us. Um, so in these covalently bonded compounds, um, there's no formal charges. So we can't use the formal charges to figure out whether these are acceptable leaving groups. Everything here is neutral. It turns out that this alcohol group is not an acceptable leaving group. Not The alcohol is not an acceptable leaving group. The OH in an alcohol is not an acceptable leaving group. But the sulfonate is an acceptable leaving group. A sulfonate is a good leaving group. On second thought, I guess it would be more complete to say that the functional group in this type of molecule is an alkyl sulfonate. Alkyl sulfonate. Now, can we explain why the alcohol is not an acceptable leaving group and the sulfonate is a good leaving group. Well, for that, we need to know who the alpha carbon is in the alkyl sulfonate. In an alkyl sulfonate, the alpha carbon is the carbon attached to the oxygen, not the carbon attached to the sulfur. This is the alpha carbon, because this is the carbon that's attached to the oxygen. Obviously, this is not the alpha carbon. All right, and um, now that we know that, um, can we think, uh, can, you, can you think of a reason why this group would be a better leaving group than this one. Can you think of a reason why this group would be a better leaving group um, than this one? Did you think about that? Uh, there's a couple of reasons why, but let's focus on the most important reason why. Now, when you're judging how good a leaving group is, it actually helps to focus the most on what the leaving group would look like after it leaves. To judge leaving group ability, we usually want to focus on what the leaving group would look like after it leaves. Um, so let's imagine that we had a nucleophilic attack here. And let's imagine that we had a nucleophilic attack here. So that would give us these products. And this would give us these products. I guess I should follow my advice and number the carbons. Um, it's probably really not necessary to number um, this carbon. We're not likely to make any mistakes copying this carbon, so I guess I won't number that one. I'll make an exception to my usual rule there. Now remember the most important part of these products to get right is the charges. Do you see how I got these charges? This oxygen started neutral and it gained electrons, so it ended up negative. And this oxygen started neutral and it gained electrons, so it also ended up negative. The most important part to get right about these products is the charges. Now, the charges make both of these oxygens somewhat unhappy. Atoms prefer to be neutral, 
But which of these oxygens is less unhappy with its negative charge? Which oxygen is better at stabilizing the negative charge? Which of these two negative charges is more stable? Well, it's the negative charge in the sulfonate that's more stable. The sulfonate has the more stable negative charge. And can you think of a reason why? Why is this negative charge in the sulfonate um, more stable than this negative charge on the oxygen? Well, there's a couple of things. There's a couple of things that are stabilizing this negative charge, but by far the most important is resonance. I bet most people did not come up with that answer. Unfortunately, most students don't think enough about resonance in the class. The most important thing that's stabilizing this negative charge is resonance. There are other resonance structures for this negative charge. Maybe I'll go ahead and draw them out. Here are some um, electron pushing arrows to form the next resonance structure. Notice that as usual, the electron pushing arrows start at the negative charge. Um, and notice that again, we change two charges. This oxygen changes from negative to neutral, and this oxygen changes from neutral to negative, because this oxygen is gaining electrons and this oxygen is losing electrons. So here is another resonance structure. And there's even a third resonance structure, isn't there? Here's a third resonance structure where now um, uh, this oxygen loses its negative charge and this oxygen gains the negative charge. So in total, there are three resonance structures for this sulfonate. Now, do these resonance structures stabilize or destabilize the negative charge? Well, do you understand what resonance means? Remember that resonance does not mean that we're changing between these structures. We're not changing between these structures what resonance means is that the real structure of the sulfonate is a blend or average of all three of these structures. There's really only one structure for the sulfonate. It's one structure that we can't really draw conveniently. All we can say is that the real structure is a kind of blend of these three structures. For example, is this bond really a single bond or a double bond? Well, neither. This bond is really a blend of a single and a double bond. And by the same token, this bond is really a blend of a double and a single bond. And this bond is a blend of a double and a single bond. And what's the charge on this oxygen? Well, it's a blend between the negative one charge here and the neutral charge here. So basically, this negative charge is being spread between these three oxygens. Um, in, in, the, in the blend, the negative charge is spread between this oxygen, this oxygen, and this oxygen. So really, each of the oxygens has a one-third negative charge. This oxygen has a one-third negative charge, this oxygen has a one-third negative charge, and this oxygen has a one-third negative charge. That's what you would get if you blend these three pictures together in, a kind, in an average. But remember, charges prefer to be spread out. Nature prefers charges to be spread out rather than concentrated, and you can see why. It's because that allows us to reduce the charge. The negative charge on this OH is concentrated. The negative charge on this OH is concentrated on just this one atom. So it's a negative one charge on this one oxygen. But because of resonance in the sulfonate, the negative one charge is spread out between three oxygens, which means each oxygen only has a negative one-third charge, and nature prefers charges to be small. Um, so this negative charge is more stable than this one because it's stabilized by resonance. I hope you can see there are no resonance structures for this um, species. There are no legal resonance structures that we can draw to spread out this negative charge, um, but there are a bunch of uh, resonance structures we can draw here. So here we can summarize uh, the logic that we just uh, discussed. After the sulfonate group leaves the alpha carbon, the negative charge on the sulfonate oxygens is stabilized by resonance. After this group left, the negative charge on the oxygens was stabilized by resonance. I'm saying on the oxygens because it's spread among the three oxygens. But because the negative charge is stabilized after the group leaves, that makes it relatively easy for the sulfonate group to leave in the first place. Because the negative charge after the group leaves will be stabilized by resonance, that makes it relatively easy for the sulfonate group to leave in the first place. So if, if we want to personify a little bit, we might say nature isn't scared of letting this leaving group leave because it knows that the negative charge is going to be spread out um, through resonance, so to speak. 
Um, and so since it's relatively easy for the sulfonate group to leave in the first place, that means the sulfonate group is a good leaving group. On the other hand, notice that that logic doesn't apply in the alcohol. Um, after the alcohol oxygen leaves, the negative charge is not spread out through resonance. That means that it is quite difficult um, for the oxygen to leave. It's quite difficult for this oxygen to leave because nature knows, so to speak, that the negative charge after it leaves will be concentrated, not spread out. And that explains why this OH group is not an acceptable leaving group. This OH group is not an acceptable leaving group because it can't stabilize the negative charge after it leaves through resonance. This oxygen is an acceptable leaving group because it can stabilize the negative charge after it leaves through resonance. So here's the logic. Um, notice that this is somewhat subtle and complicated um, logic. You should not just say that the sulfonate is a good leaving group because of resonance. Don't just say that the sulfonate is a good leaving group because of resonance. That doesn't really allow us to understand the logic. The sulfonate is a good leaving group because the negative charge after the sulfonate leaves is stabilized by resonance. We need to go, and that makes it relatively easy for the sulfonate to leave in the first place. Try, when you're thinking about this, try to go through the complete chain of logic. Don't just say, because of resonance. This is a good illustration of the general idea that when you want to judge leaving group ability, you should usually focus on what the leaving group looks like after it leaves. When judging leaving group ability, it's usually best to focus on what the leaving group will look like after it leaves. You'll see other contexts where it's useful to use this idea as well, so this is a good idea to memorize. In order to judge whether the alcohol group was a good leaving group, we thought about what the alcohol group would look like after it leaves with the negative formal charge. In order to judge whether the sulfonate was a good leaving group, we thought about what the sulfonate would look like after it leaves with the negative charge. I hope this logic makes sense to you. This is important logic to understand, but you wouldn't want to have to think through this logic so painstakingly on every example, so you should also memorize. You should also memorize that alcohols do not have acceptable leaving groups and that alkyl sulfonates do have acceptable leaving groups. An alcohol does not have an acceptable leaving group and alkyl sulfonate does have an acceptable leaving group for this reason. To summarize what we've discussed in this video, we know that most neutral atoms are not acceptable leaving groups, but now we know that neutral sulfonate groups are good leaving groups. Most neutral atoms are not acceptable leaving groups, but the sulfonate group in an alkyl sulfonate is a good leaving group. And now we also know why that is. Um, why is a sulfonate a good leaving group? Because after the sulfonate group leaves, the negative charge on the oxygen will be stabilized by resonance, and that makes it relatively easy for the sulfonate group to leave in the first place. Why is it useful to be familiar with this reasoning? Well, for one thing, um, this reasoning might be tested directly on an exam, and furthermore, this pattern of reasoning is likely to come up on exams. What patterns did we use here? Well, notice that we judged the leaving group ability by thinking about what the leaving group will look like after it leaves. When we want to explain why a sulfonate is a good leaving group, we explain that by thinking about um, what the sulfonate group will look like after it leaves. Well, that's a useful pattern that you can use for judging other leaving groups. In general, when you're judging leaving groups, you usually follow, you should usually follow the pattern of thinking about what the leaving group will look like after it leaves. And another very useful pattern that we used here is watch out for resonance. When, when resonance exists, it's usually the most important factor. Uh, well, we saw that after the sulfonate group leaves, it has a negative charge that is stabilized by resonance. And that's the most important factor um, in um, evaluating the sulfonate as a leaving group. So the, uh, the pattern that we learned about here is watch out for resonance and try to use resonance to explain phenomena in organic chemistry. Um, that's a pattern um, that will um, be frequently tested in other contexts on your OCHEM exams. Look for opportunities. Um, so if you see an OCHEM question that's asking you to explain something, look for an opportunity to use resonance to, um, as part of your explanation when possible. Now let's try a brief review quiz. Please pause the video and answer when you are drawing the products of a mechanism step, what is the most important part of the products to get right?
Here's the answer. The formal charges. That's the most important factor in organic chemistry. Next question. How many formal charges should you change for each mechanism step? Here's the answer. You should change two formal charges for each mechanism step. Next question. How do you know which two formal charges to change for each mechanism step? Again, I hope you're pausing the video and answering. Here's the answer. For each mechanism step, you should change the formal charge for the atom at the beginning of the series of arrows and the atom at the end of the series of arrows. That's why we always change two charges, because there's always one atom at the beginning of the series and one atom at the end of the series of arrows. For example, in this previous problem, can you identify what were the two atoms whose charges we changed? Well, we changed the charge on the bromine because the bromine was at the beginning of the series of arrows. And we changed the charge on this oxygen because this oxygen was at the end of the series of arrows. The bromine changed its charge from negative to neutral because the bromine was losing electrons. And this oxygen changed its charge from neutral to negative because the oxygen was gaining electrons. We always change two charges at the beginning and the end of the series of arrows. Notice we never change the formal charges for the atoms that are in the middle of the series of arrows. Don't change charges in the middle of the series of arrows. For example, carbon-1 was in the middle of this series of arrows, and therefore we did not change the formal charge on carbon-1. In the starting materials, carbon-1 has a formal charge of zero. And in the product, carbon-1 has an unchanged formal charge of zero. Remember, we're talking about formal charges right now, not delta charges. It should make sense that we don't change the charges in the middle of the series of arrows, because an atom like carbon-1 that's in the middle of the series of arrows will be gaining electrons from one arrow, but also losing electrons from the next arrow. And those two changes will cancel, so that there's no reason to change the charge on a middle atom like carbon-1 overall. Remember that formal charges are the most important factor in organic chemistry. So this is actually some of the most important material to have mastered for your success in your organic chemistry class. Make sure that you've made a habit of making sure that you've always changed two formal charges for the products for every mechanism step.